Right. Your mic's up. Right, we're starting now. It's on, right. <laughs> uh, no my heart of mine, welcome to IRL number five. This one's about journalism. Um, and journalism is something that we're talking about a lot lately. Uh, one of our panellists tonight, Mark Jennings, was in Wellington earlier today talking about it. Um, I've contributed a chapter to a book um, about journalism called Reimagining Journalism. It's called Don't Dream It's Over. Um, I hope they're right, uh, which we launch next week at Word Christchurch. Uh, and I think the fact that you're all here testifies to the strong public interest in what's going on. Including, nice to see a lot of working journalists here. Um, hope you can afford the bar. You know. <laughs> um, and also, I'm wearing my journalism shirt. Old school. Yeah, it's nice. I actually did start on a um, on a manual typewriter, a little portable Olivetti. And we had an office network in 1981 at the Christchurch Star, but it was a network of pneumatic tubes. Um, it was quite remarkable actually, I really liked it. I, I always wondered what happened to it. But um, one time on deadline for the weekend edition on a Saturday, um, uh, someone sent some very important urgent copy down to reception and there was no one working in reception because it was the 19, you know, it was the early 1980s and no one worked on Saturdays. Um, and that caused quite an emergency. Um, probably less of an emergency than you would get now with, with your average office network. Um, this is the first one of these we've done without uh, Esther McIntyre. Um, we were sad to see her go, but I'm really bloody delighted to welcome my new co-host, Leonie Hayden. Kia ora Thanks. Thanks, guys. Um, I, I was really glad that Leonie didn't take too much convincing um, because I really wanted her to do it. Um, I, I've admired her work for a long time, but particularly in what she's doing at Mana Magazine. Um, she's, she's reinvented that magazine. Um, with the help of, of Ko-Fi Media and I think what they're doing is a really good example of the fact that there are still good news stories in media and journalism. So another, another little applause for Leonie. Oh, come on. Thanks, Justin. Um, this is actually, of course, the second time you've been involved with one of these events? Yes, I did um, the event where you talked to Ali Akram and Esther talked yes. to... Lars Rando. Yeah, but you went up here, you're a DJ. I DJ'd that event and I have been promoted. Yes. So it just goes to show what um, you can do if you dream big. Which, of course, is no, um, is no offence to Alan Perrett and Liam Dan, um, <laughs> our journalistic DJ team. Um, just give it a year, guys. They're just moonlighting. It's freelance. It's freelance. It's not very secure. Um, thanks as ever to Matthew and the team at Golden Dawn. Um, they're so nice to work with. Um, and to Hugh and the team at 95VFM who do miracles. Mm -hmm. um, you may want to feel free to be as social as you like on your devices tonight. Um, and also tell people that if they go to the 95VFM Facebook page, we are for the first time available on Facebook Live as well as YouTube. Um, that what? only, yeah, I know, it only came through today. So um, that's quite exciting as well. But most of all, thanks to our sponsor, Orcon, and um, particularly Quentin Reed, who's just always been a delight to work with. And when I first suggested doing these things, he went, yep, I think I can find the budget for that. Um, so onwards. Um, it's time to let Leonie go. She'll be back later to talk to Kirsty Johnson and Alex Casey. Uh, but for now, it's my great pleasure to welcome the co-host of the most popular uh, breakfast radio show in the country, Guy on Espinner. Please welcome him. I should also point out that Guyan took no convincing either, and I was very grateful for that. Because you're never quite sure what people are going to say when you ask them to do something like this. But I, I said there will be wine. Good chance to take tomorrow off, too. So. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, man, you get up early in the morning. <laughs> uh, it doesn't seem like it, but I checked, and it's getting on for two and a half years uh, that you've been doing that job. But, um, was it a big change for you to do daily radio at first? Oh, it was a big, big change. Um, I'd come from television and I actually thought radio was going to be easier um, than television, but um, it turned out to be a lot harder, actually. 
um, especially a program like Morning Report where you've got no ads and you've got you know three hours that you're talking for. Um, so yeah, it's um, I've, I've found it more challenging um, than than television and. It took me longer, actually, as a transition to, to, to get into it and to get used to it and to feel comfortable with it than, than I had thought. I mean, p people said to me, oh, it's just um, t television without the pictures. But, um, no, it's really not. It's actually a lot, a lot different from that. Mm. And, um, yeah, it's a pretty sort of um, particular audience at Morning Report as well. So they've, they've got their views about uh, what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. So. And, and I have to say, early on, that audience kind of thought that you shouldn't be being quite as aggressive um, as you were. I mean, there, there was a feeling that, that you and Susie were perhaps being a, a little too attack dog, <clears throat> but also a feeling that you were doing it to the wrong people. You were being mean to the left. Yeah, look, I think um, when we when we first took over, um, well, I speak for myself. I mean, Susie speaks very eloquently for herself every morning, so I, I won't uh, pretend to do that. But I think that criticism, um, apart from the last bit you said, is probably fair in that um, I think I was probably too aggressive uh, at first. It's very much about picking your moments. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm aggressive to either side of the political spectrum, left, right and centre. We don't um, pull any favours there. Um, but I think um, probably started out a bit too hard, to be to be fair, and got a, quite a bit of pushback. It's funny as a journalist, I mean, you're always wanting to get to the bottom of something, don't want to let people get away with something, and so you push pretty hard. But there's the sort of balance of sympathies that I always sort of look for. You know, you've got to make sure the audience uh, knows why you are doing that, and if you elevate something really, really quickly to a really high stakes thing and really push for answers too soon, then you know I think you can alienate people. Um, journalists love aggressive interviews, but I don't know always that, aud that the aud audience do. I, I got a lot of flack just uh, a few days, or well, actually just this week. God, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> For an interview with Lawrence Yule that I did, and I thought, look, you know, the guy's a public official, he's presiding over this uh, really serious public health issue, and um, it's the middle of an election campaign. And so I went, I went at him, I don't know who heard it, but went at him reasonably hard. I got, it's funny, the feedback is very different. The text messages and emails, which I think are more conservative, they're all like, how could you? And I was being called all, all sorts of names. Twitter was a bit more um, friendly to me on that one. Um, but, um, yeah, in short answer to your question, I think we did go out too hard at the, at the beginning. And, um, you know, there's room for a bit of humour, a bit of light and shade, you know, even on uh, national radio. So, um, yeah, I think we've probably lightened up a bit. It's probably a good thing. So you do read your texts, emails and... and Twitter. Yep, I got them up. I've got um, te a text machine on a computer screen, um, email and Twitter, and I will look at that quite a bit. So if you tweet or email or text me, I'll probably pick it up. Might even read it. Might even read it out on air if it says something nice about me. <laughs> um, how, how often is it the case that people are abusive towards you? And what do you do about that? Oh, I usually just laugh. I mean, I get, um, yeah, I get quite a lot of that. Um, you get some, yeah, I mean, it's a big audience, so you get some real freaks, you know. Some people, um, <laughs> some people um, take exception to um, using Māori language, and they'll be on the text me on national radio. You get some guy, you know, from Gisborne, weirdly, texting me and saying, you know, why are you using all this Māori language, you know. So you get, you get strange sort of freaks like that, and you just don't bother about it. Um, when you get a pile on on Twitter, it can be a bit of a bit of a nuisance. But actually, we should talk talk, talk about Maori language. We should talk about your your intro in the real. It's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're trying, we're trying. How much did you practice that? Because oh, I, I, I was doing um, media tucky with, with Toy uh, when you started doing that, and he's like, "That's pretty good." <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been battling away on on the Maori language. My my wife's a pretty good pretty good speaker, and um, from her family, I've, I've learned a bit too. But I've been battling away with the books, and um, it was really cool to do Maori Language Week um, this year with um, Mihi. Um, which was which was really cool. We got an amazing amount of cool feedback from that. And so, look, you know, they were exceptions; those negative ones. I mean, people were very positive. In fact, we got um, we got that stuff up on video, and people were watching it. And um, yeah, we got heaps of good feedback. It was good. How much does the agenda-setting nature of the show um, come into your thoughts when, when you're preparing? Because it is a fact that if you if you particularly get an interview right, it will be what's talked about for the rest of the day and it will probably set the frame for the story. Yeah, I mean, um, hopefully that's right and that's what we do aim to do. 
Um, and so I come in, um, I'm in about 4.30, we have about an hour 15 to prep, so, you know, um, before we go on air at 6. Sometimes, some mornings I'll be doing 7, 8, 9, 10 interviews, um, but I'll know what the big ones are, and if I've got a minister on particularly, I'll, um, I'll really try and dig into some deep detail to, to try and get enough knowledge to unsettle them a little bit or pick a little bit deeper, you know, because the detail is what catches you. You may if you dig deep enough, even in that time, you can, you know, you can get somewhere. And um, so it's about picking your moments, about what, what, to, what to prep for. And other ones are very much on the fly. You know, you'll have a story breaking and you'll just, you'll just have to pick it up and run with it. Um, so it's a bit like swatting for an exam, really. But you, you pick the, the ones you know you're going to have a big impact and, and try and dig a bit deeper on those ones. That's, that's usually my strategy. Um, I, I've been once to, to be on Morning Report and, and sit around and watch what was going on for a while. And I was struck by how much it is on the fly and I guess it has to be you know there's talk coming up and down the line you're deciding what you're going to do next it, it, that, that's kind of interesting actually. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not quite as formal as people think no well it's formal when you come in in the morning they've got a rundown saying what you're going to do and that looks all sweet you know are oh, we going to do this here's three hours of radio uh, no problem but then the world happens and um, something breaks in America, someone's getting shot over here, we're following a story from the Herald, they finally ring back, you get them on, um, you know, someone doesn't front, so a story that you were thinking was 40 minutes away suddenly is uh, 30 seconds away and you look at the intro and you can't pronounce any of the names and know what you're talking about. Um, so, you know, there's a bit of a um, seat of the pants stuff uh, to it, which which keeps it fun and um, and immediate, you know. Um, and that, that is a big difference from the from the TV and print stuff you've done. Is that there are very few situations where you have to live on your wits like that compared to radio, where it's live radio. I think the time I was in, you hadn't prepped for something, and <gasps> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, someone will say, "Well, you are doing this interview now," and you're like, "Oh my god!" And you'll just you know, um, you you'll just grab your, whatever notes were there and, and just try and try and wing it. Um, so yeah, that keeps it fun. Mm. So it's, it's, as the rugby coaches say, it's playing what's in front of you. In, in that respect it is, yeah. But then, um, you know, I'll also have those interviews that I've, you know, prepped for, you know, maybe 40 minutes on something and actually written out a question line for a minister and think, oh, this is the strategy of the interview and actually written out the exact quotes and dug into the, read most of the cabinet paper and it really is about picking your moments. I mean, some things work well on the fly, others don't. I mean, I'm amazed some journalists go into interviews with ministers who have been prepped to the nines and had know their way out of anything, and they just seem to be flinging questions at them. It's never gonna, you're never gonna get anything different than just the spin lines if you just if you just blunder into it. So I, I well, maybe if you're really good, I, I tend to feel that I need enough uh, detail and structure to a, a big picture interview like that to actually, you know, nut it out quite a bit. Is there anyone you really hate interviewing? And I'm thinking, <laughs> Winston Peters. Well, Winston takes a while to crack. The last interview I had with Winston, um, I think I admitted smoking cannabis on national radio. Not that I smoked cannabis on, <laughs> on national, national radio. radio right? But um, <laughs> it was fun. Tweet that. And, um, <laughs> you know, someone got in touch with me, or someone went on Twitter and said, you actually made Winston Peters laugh from, I think they said the heart, would that be fair? Or the, or the stomach or whatever. Um, it, was, it, was, it was fun and... and you know, we've all had the scraps with Winston. It's a bit of a rite of passage in journalism. Um, and they're great fun. And you'll have a stash, and we'll have a stash with them in election year. You know, who are you going to go with? And there'll be a fright over there. But, um, yeah, he, he's, he's mellowed a bit too, though. Eh? He's, he's a bit different now. He's, he's changed a bit. Um, so I quite like interviewing Winston. Um, I find um, Liam Brown very difficult. Um, I can't understand anything he says. Um, but... Um, yeah, I don't. Is it just me or? Um, mm. Yeah, I, I, so I, it, it's fun interviewing the confrontational ones. Guys like Stephen Joyce or Jerry Brownlee, they'll come back at you. Helen Clark was the same. Michael Cullen, Winston Peters. Key's hard to interview because you, you hit him and it just slides off, and he's like he doesn't ever seem too phased by it. Um, he doesn't react to you. The tension is natural. Uh, tension is quite good. That's a really interesting way of putting it because some quite frequently you know, I've heard you interview him and. and he says things that would have been a real problem for any other politician. Yeah, it's a funny one. He um, he just, like if he was interrupted by a 19-year-old student journalist, he would just shut up immediately. You know, it's amazing. When you watch him, I mean, he, you know, like most politicians, like Helen Clark would have said, you know, 
who are you? You know, like, um, and and she would just like give you the death stare, even if you'd been in the gallery for ten years. But Key, I mean, his his whether it's a natural thing about his personality or a, a tactic, it's hard to separate the two. But he um, he just um, he just doesn't seem to get rattled at all or get angry at all, um, and so. Yeah, as an interviewer, you're kind of looking for reaction. It's 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 hard to explain, I suppose, but it's a bit like yeah, it's a bit like clutching at mist, I suppose, in some ways. Um, these haven't necessarily been easy times for for Radio New Zealand because your budget <coughs> has not increased in the last eight years now, um, and I imagine there have been sacrifices. But I also I'm also guessing that that rather good survey that you had um, last month would have um, been quite a fillip. Was, how was that received? Totally. I mean, it was, it was really nice to be compared with the um, commercial stations, and it was cool that people are listening to, you know, three years of pretty serious radio in the morning, which was cool. I think it was cool for journalism too. Um, so that, that was nice. Uh, you're right, a frozen budget, although uh, Paul Thompson says, you know, having a frozen budget in the media can be quite a good uh, thing at the moment because everyone else's budgets are, what, melting away. Um, <laughs> Nah, my word's actually not his, but um, the sentiment's the same. Um, and he, I think, has been incredibly creative and skillful at, at um, organising that money. Yeah, some things have gone by the wayside that, that we wouldn't have wanted to let go. Um, some things have had to be short or, or play less frequently. But he's managed to get you know Campbell on, on air in the studio and having that. It's pretty extraordinary, I think. Um, you know, as you say, on, on a fixed budget. So you know, I think there's a lot of things to be proud of. So you can see a way ahead. Yeah, definitely. And in fact. Probably Radio New Zealand's um, position and role is probably more important than ever now. Um, you know, when you look at what um, else is happening in, in the commercial media and the breakdown of the business model of a lot of journalism, um, having taxpayer public funded uh, radio is incredibly important, I think. Um, you only have to listen to the, the difference of the focus. Uh, that a lot of commercial media, and it's, you know, I understand those pressures, I've, I've worked in them, but it's a, it's a very different beast and it's a very important thing to have, I think. You've self-identified about ten times since we've been talking as a journalist. Um, do you think it's, a, it's important that people in your kind of role mm -hmm. do that? Because because there, are, there have been people who've sat in the same seat as you who, who would not have called themselves journalists. Yeah, I mean, that's all I've ever done, is journalism. Um, I don't know that I could do anything else, but um, yeah, I mean, I've always seen myself as a, as a journalist, and um, yeah, you do hear that, eh? You hear people say, oh, I'm a, I'm a broadcaster, not a journalist, so that means I can do X, Y, and Z at the same time. Um, the last person I heard say that was Sean Hannity, he said it yesterday or the day before, who's also advising Trump, um, as well as holding a, an hour of prime, it's a true story, and New York Times ran it big today, Sean Hannity, an hour of prime time on Fox News, and also advising Donald Trump, and he said, quote, I'm not a journalist, so, and I'm making no secret of the fact that I want Trump to be the President of the United States. Again, his words, not mine. But, um, yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting... Tweet that. <laughs> Uh, it's an interesting one, but I've yeah, I mean, I've, I've always called myself a journalist. That's all um, what I've what I've what I've done. Have you ever been just finally actually because we have to mm. uh, wrap up at the moment? Uh, have you ever been uh, tapped to go to the dark side? Because a lot of very good political journalists are now political comms professionals. No, oh, a couple of people have rung me from search firms and and asked um, asked me uh, to do stuff like that, but. Um, no, I haven't been tempted. Do you think you'd be any good at it? I don't know. Um, I'd probably leak terribly. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I've... <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. it's like, wow, you should hear about this. <laughs> I always wondered what it would be like to be in the, um, you know, working for a minister. You get given the cabinet papers and you're like, oh, Liam, oh, Corin, oh, Duncan, <laughs> Paddy, you, you know. Um, so, yeah, yeah. anyone who watches this won't hire me now, will they? So. No, <laughs> exactly. Hey, um, thank you very much, Guyan. And um, Guyan will be back for the final panel. Um, do remember that you can. Uh, there's a box on the end of the bar there where you can write questions, and if we like the questions, we'll ask them. Um, don't be offended if we don't. Um, uh, but again, thank you very much, Guyan Eskimo. And we'll have a 10 minute break now, uh, and then Leone will be back with uh, Kirsty and Alex, and that's going to be good. Cheers.
All right, we are going to push on. Um, much as it, it really did kill me to, to fade down um, Fleetwood Mac there. It's a good song. Yay. Hey, thank you. Okay, um, our next panel's up, and um, just maybe be a little bit careful about talking at the back because it makes it hard for other people to hear. Um, Ooh, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, only 20 I'm, minutes, then you've got some more time. So, Okay, Leone. Thank you, Russell. Um, and thank you again for that very warm welcome earlier. I really appreciate that. Um, and Esther, if you're watching at home in the Gold Coast, wherever it is that you live now, I hope I do you justice and we really miss you. Um, I'd really like, um, I'm really honoured to introduce um, my guests for tonight, uh, Alex Casey from the spinoff.co.nz and Kirsty Johnson from the New Zealand Herald. You will make your way to the stage. Please. You can pull your microphones in nice and close if you want. Um, so both my, both my guests tonight are media botherers of the highest order. Um, in my opinion, um, two of the brightest shining talents um, in media today. We're not just here so that this didn't turn into like a sausage fest. I am actually interviewing two of the most talented journalists in New Zealand. Um, so we have Kirsty Johnson, um, ace investigative reporter from the New Zealand Herald, um, and Alex Casey, the TV editor um, and me uh, cultural commenter, commentator for the spinoff.co.nz. Um, and I thought what we might do is uh, just sort of peer behind the veil a little bit um, and have a chat about your backgrounds um, and the, the people and places that are sort of responsible for all of this monstrous talent. Um, and what led you guys to a career in media and also some of your um, professional highlights so far. So we'll start with um, Alex. Yes. Where did you grow up? <clears throat> oh, okay. <laughs> Going way back. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a little town called Featherston in the Wairarapa. Oh. Um, and it was, it was quite little. Yeah. And then when I kind of got to high school age, I moved up here to live with my mum in Auckland. Yeah. It was, my, my world opened. Um, and are your your family, your parents, were you sort of a rambunctious lot? Are they responsible for these forthright opinions for your um, the fact that you're not not shy <laughs> to speak your mind? Maybe I think more. Well, my mum is Kathy Casey. She's on the Auckland City Council. She's ve a very loud Scottish woman. She's and amazing. <laughs> Councillor Kathy Casey also drives a car with a picture of Councillor Kathy Casey on the side of it, which I just think is incredible. Giant on the bonnet as well. And she's always been like that, you know. We'd go on school trips, she used to work in Parliament, and I'd turn up with, like, my school friends, and she would come down with a giant, like, uh, bunch of Alliance helium balloons just to give out. That's fine. Just give those <laughs> to five-year-olds. So she was always, like, the super loud, opinionated one, yeah. and she's always kind of forced that in me and yeah. pointed out things, been like, look at that, that's wrong. Like, maybe you should talk about yeah. that. Yeah. So you had quite a keen interest in um, like film and television and media early on, um, but you've said before that it wasn't until you sort of also um, started doing gender studies at university that your purpose in media sort of became clear. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, I didn't know that it could be a, a purpose in media though. I kind of I started doing sociology when I was doing my film and television degree and. The only way that I saw I could possibly have a career in that was to stay forever and do a PhD and eventually get to that level when I'm like, you know, maybe 40, 45, release a book. Like, yeah. that was my plan, you know. And thank God that didn't happen. <laughs> it was boring. No, it was boring. No. <laughs> way beyond that. Um, Kirsty, tell us where you, who's responsible for all this and where? Uh, probably my dad's side of the family. There's a lot of them, and they're very shouty. And so, <laughs> if you wanted to make yourself heard, you kind of had to yell. And I guess that's... Is that a big family? Um, they're not that big. They're just, just particularly loud. shouty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And did you train? Did you train as a as a journalist? Yeah, I took probably the most pedestrian route that you could to become a reporter. Um, I did an, a media and English degree, and then I went to Massey to do postgrad journalism, got an internship, went to the Taranaki Daily News, worked at Stuff, worked at the Sunday Star Times, and then now I'm at the Herald. So. That is, yeah, that's the path that you're meant to take towards journalism. Yeah, although... I'm like the shining light. Massey always put me in their brochures, like, this is how you do it. Come to our <laughs> university. <laughs> 
Um, so, Kirsty published um, a series of stories this year about um, an autistic man named Ashley Peacock um, who'd be kept in a de-escalation unit, essentially kept in seclusion uh, for five years in a mental health facility in Porirua. Um, Kirsty's investigation shone a light on um, mental health care um, and turned Ashley Peacock actually kind of into sort of a, a household name overnight. Um, I want to know, you know, with a story, with a project that big, um, you know, where do you start with a story like that? Is it um, OIA requests? Is it is it contacting the family? Um, the family actually came to me. I'd done some work in disability before, and they had an advocacy group who who knew me from that work, and they said, talk to Kirsty. Um, <clears throat> and initially I was quite hesitant because he just had a documentary done on him, and he'd been in the Dominion Post a couple of times. But then, I don't know, I think my conscience kind of got to me, and I started just thinking about how to make the mm. story um, one so that it would have a lot of impact. Um and so I got in touch with the parents and I basically, I went to Wellington and I spent a couple of days just looking through all their records, which is um, a room in their house. So I just sat in there and kind of I read a whole lot of stuff um, and then just went home and just thought about it. Mm. It was a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I didn't actually need to do any <clears throat> OAAs. I tried, but I knew I'd get denied anyway. Um, so, yeah, and then I just started piecing together bit by bit. I really wanted to build up his story over a long period of time, and so that's what I tried to do. Um, and in your role as an uh, investigative reporter for The Herald, um, is, that, is that the sort of project they will give you a lot of space around, a lot of freedom to follow leads and spend a bit of time building up your story? Yeah, that one, um, I'd done something that I didn't really want to do just before that, and so I kind of used that as a bargaining chip. I one, was like, one for you, one I for I will them. do this, and then I'm going to do this. <laughs> so, yeah. And what's the, I mean, the the series um, that you published, I mean, let alone just the first one, um, huge conversation nationwide. What is the immediate feedback like to a story like that, or the immediate repercussions um, to a story like that, to you personally? Um, I got a lot of emails about Ashley, probably the most that I've had on a single issue story like that, mm. and they were overwhelmingly positive, like I've never had such a response that was just like, how can we help, oh my god, we know we knew Ashley as a child, we feel so bad for him, what do we do, this is appalling, um, so you had that from the public perspective, and I think people were genuinely outraged because he is the, kind of the pointy end of the wedge and people don't know that that goes on um and then the other side was the public uh the you know the government feedback which was basically nothing to see here mm. um your reporting is inaccurate um yeah go away um and is that something they can get away with just what you're saying is wrong end of I mean, presumably you're not allowed to print I've been, something I've been, if yeah. it's This is the thing. I've said to them, um, there's the minister's office, Sam Lotoenga, and um, the ministry, uh, not the ministry, sorry, the district health board. I've said to them, you are telling people, because what's happening now is that people will write a letter to the minister saying, um, we have read about Ashley, we think it's inappropriate, we want you to do something. And they send a letter back saying oh, that story had misinformation in it, it was inaccurate. And so I've written to them and said, what is wrong with my story? Yeah. Like, stop telling people that here is a form to fill out if you want to launch a press council complaint. Yeah. And they haven't done that, so I really don't know where it goes. So it's from here. a defence mechanism. Yeah, I think it is. And somebody was talking about like post truth politics. Mm. Um, I don't know if it's that or if it's just willful kind of blindness, but that's the point where we're at at the moment. What's your sort of um, code of care or your responsibility to? the subject himself. Well, I mean, it's not just Ashley, it's also his parents involved and um, everyone involved is quite vulnerable. Um, as as the journalist, what have you put in place around their safety? Um, I thought really carefully about whether it was worth doing the story on a national level and whether we should have put it on the front page and whether we should have filmed Ashley and exposed him to the type of debate he is now subject to with mm. like there are some quite horrible allegations being made about him and he's been subject to conversation in parliament um 
and I said that to his parents, I said, you know, if this happens, you will be subject to that kind of scrutiny. But they were happy with it at the end of the day, and they want him to be out. And so I couldn't do anything except go with their wishes. Mm, whatever it takes to, to get him the care that he needs. It makes yeah. sense. Um, do you struggle then with becoming too close? to your subjects? Is it hard to sort of have that professional distance that you need to write about the subject without getting too involved with the family? It can be quite difficult because I feel really strongly for them. They are elderly, they are vulnerable, they are frustrated. Um, but then I was really careful to go to this really broad spectrum of people and be like, are they justified in wanting this? Like, is he dangerous? Is this correct? Is this how a person should be treated? What is the human rights law? Mm. So I went through and I ticked all the boxes and overwhelmingly every single expert that I went to, all these people off the record as well that work in these services, they all said, no, this is horrific. And mm. you've got the ombudsman who is like the arbiter of you know of information and they are saying this is not right and so all you can do as a journalist is is trust those people in the yeah. end um and that's yeah that's how I kind of worked that situation mm. Mm. Oh, it's fascinating you've done an amazing job um we're gonna ask Alex some questions about some of her professional highlights so Alex is um quite well known for her um commentary on shows like The Bachelor and Dancing with the Stars and The X Factor and now we have her thoughts on the Real Housewives of Auckland to look forward to um all of which have proven quite unlikely vehicles for um feminist commentary on um how women are discussed in the media how women and women's bodies are viewed in the public arena um so Alex, you've called out quite a lot of problematic behaviour in your um, short time at the spin-off, <laughs> um, such as your essay in defence of Crystal Shinnery um, about the crotch shaming incident involving Dominic Harvey from The Edge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and all of these these conversations are important issues that have real world effects on women's self issue, uh, self image and especially young women. Um, you told me in one of our um, On The Rag podcasts, so Alex and I do a monthly podcast for the spin-off where we discuss um, issues that affect women, usually in the realms of media and pop culture. Um, and you told us in one of our podcasts about um, a, another media practitioner, a male, oh, no. basically telling you <laughs> um, that you were doing feminism wrong. Because celebrities and TV culture was frivolous, and to be like a good feminist in the media, you should be concentrating on things like women in prison um, yep. and those kinds of issues. I, yeah. Why, after that spectacular moment of mansplaining, um, why is why is Monsieur Mansplain wrong? Oh my God! I'm so glad you went straight in with that. Um, I don't know, I feel like it just communicates a, a deep under, like misunderstanding of what people like and what people yeah. respond to. Like, yeah. that's always been the way that I kind of like talking about reality TV is it reaches a wide number of people, even if people hate The Bachelor and hate Real Housewives, like a lot of people do, they still know what it is and they will still... A lot of them will still engage in the comments and say, "Yeah, not an news. overwhelming number of people will so many engage with these these shows." Yeah, um, and I always thought that's kind of an interesting platform to put out these ideas that might be a bit confronting and challenging that people might not have seen before mm. and kind of change people's minds a little bit. Um, you know, I'm not saying that you know working with women women in prisons isn't doing anything. I, you know, it's yeah. it's all relative, and I think it's kind of just chipping away. My skill set that I have is talking about popular culture, yeah. and I genuinely believe that popular culture reflects what the world is. Yeah. And if you can call out someone like Dom Harvey for being a jerk the entire time, you know, <laughs> yeah. I feel like that does professionally. Something. If that gets picked up and people read that, and especially when people read that who don't know that mm. you know which quite a few people did it yeah. was like i feel i i would hope that that does something yeah it might not it's probably fine but <laughs> you went to a um a real housewives event recently where one of the housewives told you to stop eating bread and carbs after yeah, you ordered a risotto her. 
Because it's like the big thing of bread came to the table and I was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As you should. Bread's the greatest food ever. For free. Like, it was free. And it's free. <laughs> I mean, do you ever wonder, though, because because you are one of the the loudest voices on TV culture, so you're constantly invited to attend these ridiculous TV events. You also went to a plastic surgery one recently. Mm. Um, do you ever wonder that the establishment that you're sort of trying to rail against, that you're trying to critique, have accepted you too much? I, I mean, like how they I, get out of it, knowing that I you're going to come to their event and then write about how ridiculous the people are. I don't know. I think it's just like this weird thing between they're like, any publicity is good publicity. And I'm yeah. like, I'm not sure if that's true. <laughs> <laughs> like that, I got invited to the launch of Beauty and the Beach and I was just, there were not many media invited. It was at someone's house, just up the road. It was so weird. It was so weird. And I was talking to the producer of that show who was started in maybe a drunken rant, talking about how women who get plastic surgery are retarded. And all, this is and the producer of the show the about The producer of the surgery. show. Because I was holding out hoping like maybe this is about women being empowered in a world that makes them want to be perfect and yeah. who can blame them for that. And when you get the producer of the show saying, this is retarded, you start to think like, oh, this is coming from the top down, this problem. Yeah. This guy has no idea about any of this. And also he's got no idea who he's talking to. Because yeah. I was like... <laughs> <laughs> Did he not know? No. No. No, it was fine. I didn't well, tell him. It was cool. It's fine. <laughs> um, Alex obviously isn't that's uh, not the only kind of um, story that she has written for um, the spinoff.co.nz um, also uh, recently Alex and uh, the spinoff editor Duncan Greve co-wrote um, a story called I Will Come Forward um, which investigated claims of sexual abuse um, by some young women against a very prominent figure in Auckland's um, music scene you guys consulted at length with lawyers throughout that whole process. I mean, it's still a story that for any other media outlet, the legal team would have said, burn it and throw it in a hole, yeah, don't no go way. anywhere near this. Um, because at the point that you published it, there had been no complaints to police, let alone convictions. Um, but as a result of that story, we saw uh, a lot more people, a lot more women from the music industry coming forward with their own stories, um, stories that had never been told to anyone, let alone police. Um, what I mean, a lot of people were too scared to come forward, even to talk about their friend about it with their friends. And um, what were your some of your fears around publishing that story? Um, I think my main fear, and something we consulted with even Tim Murphy, who I think is here, um, advised us on how to deal with the. We were expecting a lot of backlash, and we were particularly worried about the woman. Um, when you go public with something like that, obviously their names were changed, and you know we we took great great lengths to you know make them not identifiable. Um, but I was really worried that it would kind of become this trial by media, as we got called we got called yeah. vigilante witch hunters on whale oil, which I thought was quite cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. and, but that was kind of the extent of the backlash. I thought it might go a lot further than that, and I was just really worried that they would feel like they had made a huge mistake mm. bringing it to us because. All we wanted to do was try and give them a, a platform. All you know, they just wanted their voices to be heard. They just wanted what they considered their form of justice, which was getting their story out to the community that would recognise, mm. you know, this man and hold him accountable for his actions. It wasn't about going to the police, and you know, even if it was, I think it's been proven that the justice system isn't too kind on on that kind yeah, of case. Yeah, the statistics are certainly against you. Yeah, so that was kind of our main fear. So we took great lengths to do things like switch off the comments and have social media monitored and you know just try and make it as safe space for them as possible mm. and I, I hope that we did that because yeah it would have been we had kind of worries about you know men in this coming out and the men's rights <laughs> wherever they are like yeah. seeping through the internet and they're always there lurking in the background yeah yeah you know that was the main concern over the legal stuff we we were consulted with lawyers from the very beginning mm. and I felt quite safe in that regard even though I have no idea you know what the safe is supposed to feel like in that yeah, situation. Yeah, absolutely. But they were very determined, like, you know, the lawyers in, in this story are kind of the heroes as well as these women because they were just putting their asses on the line to kind of get this through, you know. Yes, yes, the unsung heroes. Um, I want to ask you both about, I mean, I, I want so badly for this question to be totally irrelevant, but I feel that it's not. You're both um, petite women, 
young, Thank you. blonde. <laughs> Why? <laughs> um, small. And so small. Um, I want to know that in your experience um, in the media, has have you experienced um, people not taking you seriously as journalists, as writers, and um, yeah, what are some of the struggles that you might have faced as, as women working in the media? Who wants to go first? <laughs> Kirsty. I feel like, I don't know if it's that people don't take me seriously. I think it's like the constant tone of surprise when they're like, oh, you did some reading <laughs> before you rang me? You're like, yes, I did. I did. I read some documents. Um, or that they, like, I've got a few contacts who will message me things and I'll reply being like, oh, you know, don't tell me how to do my job or like, you know, whatever. And they're like, oh, you're so feisty. And I'm like, if I was a man, mm. would you treat me like this? Like, I'm literally just. So you tell people doing like straight up, don't tell me how to do my job. Yeah, I and mean, people are like, if you were doing your job properly, you would do this. I'm like, would I? Like, how do you know? You're not a journalist. And also, how do you say that to me? Yeah. And then if I reply, they're like, oh, you're so feisty. Or if I ring people and I just want <laughs> something straight away, they're like, you're very strident. I'm like, <laughs> that's not a new word for cool. bossy. Yeah. Like, yes, I want it now. Yeah. <laughs> Give it to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So awesome. I don't know. The... So it's something you may have encountered, but it's not something that you've let, let stop. You do your job as a professional journalist. No, clearly. I feel like sometimes I was actually talking to a few of my colleagues, all women, this afternoon about this, and they all said actually one of them is a sports reporter. It's just the attitude of like as a woman you feel like you have to be more apologetic or you mm. should be like really nicey nicey. Like, oh hi, um I just was wondering if I could like have a thing that you have. It's like no, you don't need to be like that. You can just ring out and be like, I need those documents, can you have them to me within half an hour, thank you. Yes. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. No, I agree. And I mean, that is an attitude that um, is all pervasive in life. Mo in life, in most industries, you do find yourself sort of apologising more than perhaps your male counterparts do. Mm. Um, is that something mm. other than our supreme mansplain moment that we covered earlier? Yeah, yeah. Is that something that you've come across a lot? I get mansplained to just. All the time, like all the time. Uh, before we turned the comments off, there was like a serial guy, and his job was to just like discount like my whole opinion. He would come on everything, especially if it was of a feminist issue. And oh, the, this is yeah, what, this I is his explanation guy. for why I was upset. He would just say, "You've just got a sandy vagina." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Thank you, sir. Thank you, anonymous sir." Um. <clears throat> so, you know, it's great. Um, <laughs> I hope you hit him with some of your best comebacks. I mean, you don't have to be polite to a guy like that, surely. I was just, I don't know what to do. It's, just, yeah. it's in the comments, you know. I can't come back in and be like, actually, no. Yeah. You know? <laughs> There's no sand in my it's vagina. Thank you very much. <laughs> so that was good. Like, it, obviously, that's just, you know, yeah. not a proper nice human. We had like recently, I wrote, co recently co wrote a piece with Leah Dam on the spin off about uh, this was a, a shitter of a week for women about mm. the Chiefs thing and Cougar Line and that bad CEO guy. And someone wrote a point by point rebuttal and sent it to Duncan Grieve, our editor, and wow. was like, you can publish this for free if you want. <laughs> and it was like, and it was like, this is why it wasn't a shitter week for women by a man. <laughs> and the crux of it was like, you've got the vote. Stop complaining. <laughs> Mic drop, end it's like, of. It's true. Yeah, that's it's amazing. True. It's amazing people will still put that much work so much effort. He was so into angry. He was so making angry. sure that your voice isn't <laughs> legitimate. You know, and, I know um, and at the end of the day, we're the ones that get called things like hysterical. <laughs> it's like, I'm not the one who took a fucking hour out of my day to write a point by point rebuttal email to a website. Like, you're insane. True <laughs> that. Um, I could do this all night. Um, but that, <laughs> that is, thank you so much for um, coming and talking to us tonight. <laughs> Alex and Percy. And Russell will be back in about 10 minutes time um, with our next guest so um, give yourself a drink
you know the sound of it is something quite atrocious. If you say it loud enough, you'll always sound precocious. Super
down and sit down now if you like. Well, but I don't know, you know. <laughs> uh, we're back. Um, I, I just thought that last panel was fantastic, and that is the first time Leonie's done anything like that, and I think she's a natural. So, you know, we've got to measure up to that. We, we're, now, we're now in the, uh, the old white guys phase of the evening. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I'm... Shout out to all the people watching online, and there actually are a lot of them. It's really, really hard to get people to watch your live stream, and um, uh, they're doing it. There's been about a thousand of you on and off, um, which is fantastic. Um, and anyone who missed it or wants to see it again, um, it'll be edited up and put online by um, Hugh and his team at 95 BFM, um, who are doing a magnificent job. I'm really grateful for them. But moving on. Um, as I said, old white guys, um, these two people next to me have been at the very top echelon uh, of media in New Zealand, and they left. Um, we might even ask them why they left. Um, please welcome Tim Murphy, former editor of the uh, New Zealand Herald, and Mark Jennings, former head of news and current affairs, founding head of news and current affairs, and, and there for a very, very long time. I'm very grateful to have both of them. Please welcome them. Um, well, guys, um, I was actually quite excited because Liam Dan, DJ Liam, um, pointed out um, uh, over a week ago that the Commerce Commission was due to uh, drop its decision on the Fairfax NZME merger yesterday afternoon. I thought, wicked, we can talk about that. Um, they haven't. Tim, do you have any idea why they would have asked for a seven-month extension? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it that hard? I No, I do. And it's partly because the Commerce Commission can't walk and eat at the same time. They don't have enough people. But it's also because uh, they've discovered from the submissions that were made, and there were 50 or so, that people have got some concerns not just on the advertising and commercial side of it, but on the journalism side of it. And yesterday they came out and said, you know, we want to uh, examine the issues of quality and accuracy, which was never something that the Commerce Commission would have entertained in the past. That's really interesting. That's, that's a, a, actually an unusual thing for the Commerce Commission to say, isn't it? It was. And so they've, they've gone from having a three-month thing from May to August um, to November, which is when they're going to uh, have the preliminary dis the decision. Then a c possible conference, a, a, a um, hearing on it where they interview people. So it's a much more serious look at media than people were expecting, than I was expecting, uh, and I think it's going to be very good to actually thrash it out in advance of whatever happens. Hmm. Mark, um, I presume you're pleased by the, by the delay and the extra consideration, because you're not a fan of the merger, are you? No, I'm not a fan, Russell. I, um, I firmly believe it's very detrimental for the media in this country. Um, I'm a huge fan of competition. Um, I think competition leads to better journalism. Uh, it makes journalists strive harder, and I think this merger is, you know, it's disastrous, really. Um, I, I'm heartened by what Tim's saying, uh, that the uh, ConCom is going to take a, a more sophisticated and tougher look at it, and maybe this is a, a little bit of light in the tunnel here. But, I mean, those two companies um, are in a difficult position. Newspaper revenues are tanking. Uh, is, is there a way through this that solves that while maintaining the, the competition and dynamism that, that, that you enjoy? Well, they're, they're in a race to the bottom, from what I can see. Uh, it's just clickbait, clickbait, clickbait. And um, I don't know. I, I just think they should, one of them should just stepped out of that race, frankly. Hmm. Which one? <laughs> you volunteer. <laughs> yes. Uh, Tim might have a view. Hmm. Well, look, I don't think it's just clickbait because there's tremendous stuff being done through both those sites and through terrific journalists like Kirsty and others, but but it is, uh, has become a race uh, to the bottom because of numbers, and there's a de declaration we need to be number one, and that fight overwhelmed everything to the point that, you know, and, and look, uh, Liam won't mind me saying, I hope, um, uh, from his uh, DJ platform, that, uh, you know, the, the, the Herald Business site got great readership today over a uh, fraudster in Australia. 
and that meant numbers for the business readership. It had probably, Liam, sorry, not so great a relevance to what business is being done here and how it's being done and what it's affecting New Zealand customers, but it does deliver readership. So once you declare we're going to go for readership only uh, then, and numbers only, then it changes the judgment. And I think that's an issue that you know it goes on through all digital media, obviously. Well, it was actually Matt Nippet this week who who tweeted the news that, that the Daily Mail, which is, is considered the exemplar of that kind of publishing, um, of, of clickbait publishing, and you will read Daily Mail stories on the Herald website every day, only made forty four million pounds. Um, which sounds like a lot, but for the size of that organisation, it's not. I mean, it, it is. Is that advertising model even viable anymore? I don't think it is. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that's been going through my mind a lot is this tax on Facebook and Google. Um, I really think that that needs to happen. And I think that the money needs, that the government collects, needs to go into two areas. I think it needs to go into tax breaks for traditional media uh, who are trying to be quality, do quality journalism. And I think it needs to go into better funding of public media. Um, I'm talking the, mm, I'm talking R and Z probably at, at this point, but I think there can be other uh, forms of uh, public interest media too. What's going to make that happen, though? Because R and Z's been sitting there on, a, on an eight-year funding freeze, and there, you know, Richard Griffin can can huff and puff all he likes, but it doesn't appear the government is going to, is going to shift on that. Maybe not, unless there is a grassroots movement. And I'm starting to sense that. I was at a conference talking in Wellington today um, about quality journalism. And you can sense that the, the population is getting a bit sick of all this. And, uh, but, you know, governments only move when that happens. And if they think they're going to lose at the ballot box, that will spur them. But, you know, there's, there's some... Um, there's some lobbying going on, and I think it's having some impact. Tim, do you have a view? <laughs> <laughs> Look, yeah, I think, well, this government may not, but this government may not be much longer of this world either. And, no, well, you know, you, you look at the, the, the interestingly, the spin off poll that came out yesterday, the Auckland vote for party vote was fascinating because Auckland may well not be sitting with National as it was. And if you start to get that going away on you, then bigger things happen down the track. Now, National may not be in the ascendancy and therefore others with a different view of the value of Radio New Zealand, the value of journalism and information and the public good uh, will come up. Um, we'll discuss that further um, later on, but uh, you said spin-off poll. Um, spin-off poll in association with Jennings Murphy. Is that the first time you've actually broken cover and done something? <laughs> it is the first thing we did. <laughs> but all we did was, was talk people into it and then hand it over. So I don't think we got a brokerage fee. Right. It's, in a sense, though, it's a classic established media, uh, establishment media move, isn't it? You, you make a poll because it generates news for you, and hopefully someone else reports it. And John Campbell, bless his heart, actually gave it quite a lot of airtime on his show. Did he mention Jennings Murphy? <laughs> <laughs> he mentioned Murphy. <laughs> Um, let's talk about Jennings Murphy because it was very exciting when you announced it. You you teased it on Twitter, you know. Yes. What, what are these two men doing meeting in Titarangi? Um, um, where are you at with it? Do you have commercial clients yet? Uh, yes, we do. And so there's two parts to our business, if you like. There's the consultancy side, um, and and the aim of that is just to tick us over a bit while we work on uh, what we really want to do, and that's a new news platform. And we have been making progress on that. Uh, Tim will go and uh, talk at length about this because we've talked to nearly everybody in New Zealand <laughs> about it. Um, we've been taking our time because, as everybody, well, lots of people in this room know, and I've been talking to them tonight, it's, a, it's tricky, it's hard, including you, Russell. Um, so we don't want to lose anybody's money and we don't want to lose our own um, and we want to go into it with the right values and um, the right resourcing. So we, we, we make no apology for taking our time but we have got closer in the last um, few days actually.
so, so close that yesterday we were walking along the street after a meeting, which was a good meeting, and Mark stopped me and said, I think we could be in business. And this is after three months and about 150 people uh, meetings we've had. Uh, but yeah, things might come together quite swiftly now because some good things are, are possible. Yeah. So we're talking about this being the news site? Yeah, news and current affairs site um, and uh, <coughs> working with some other, collaborating really, with some other media and some other tech people. Yeah. Um, will the commercial consulting side of the business remain in operation? I'm not judging, actually. No, 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 <laughs> no not, not sure in terms of the current consulting we're doing. We're doing a bit of media training, and our media training is very much of the, um, we call it fronting up, and that's basically to tell people to get out and approach the media in a way that is with integrity and early and senior and, and open. Um, so we're coming from a very journalistic background to that. Uh, but that's been something that's been quite good, and we've done a bit of that. Uh, not a lot of, of, well, none, no PR in the sense of the classic PR. Uh, but what we hope to do is to be able to do a mix on the site of straight out news journalism and corporate storytelling, defined and transparent. Duncan and the guys are doing it the spin off pretty bloody well. And that kind of model, which we think there is room for, so long as you're showing what it is and where it is. Uh, and, and a lot of it will be video storytelling, we hope. Mm. That was actually going to be my next question, because I, I'm not sure whether everyone knows how the spin-off operates. Um, they employ, what, 12, 13 staff? Um, and it's, a, it's magnificent. But those staff uh, will, in the course of a working day, turn around and make commercial content for paying clients, and then turn back to the editorial stuff. And I think they manage it really well. Do you think that is... Yeah, is that a model for the future? I think it's one of the models, to be honest, Russell, and I, I don't think it's a model that... It does have its problems um, because, you know, independence from the people that uh, you cover is still an important part of quality journalism in, in my mind, so I think the model does have its challenges. But then it comes down to how do you make journalism pay? How, how, how do you raise enough revenue to do it? And I, you know, like Tim, I have a lot of admiration for Duncan and his team, uh, doing this, and they are treading a fine line though, um, I think it's um, you know, sort of incumbent on all of us to keep ourselves honest around this, and if we have a vibrant media scene in this country, then it will keep everybody honest. Um, the other thing I think that I find really interesting in media is the rise of um, is advocacy media. We've seen Transport Blog. Um, we've seen Greenpeace hire Tim McKinnell a, as an investigator. And they have, in the course of doing that, radically raised the level of information available in the public sphere, sphere on their issues. And I, I'm also aware that my best gig is with the Drug Foundation magazine, which is an advocacy group. Um, what do you make of that? Is it, you know, it, it's filling a gap, but are there risks there too? Yes and no. I think a lot of what's coming from those sort of groups is mm. absolutely adding to what we know and what we should know, and it's filling gaps that the mainstream has had to withdraw from. Uh, over time. So no, I, I don't see it as a negative at all. The more information the merit. So long as there are still people who are detached and able to say, well, hang on, that's pushing a certain slant. Mm -hmm. And I made a big mistake, as you noted to me. Um, in last weekend, I was a weekend before last, I was ill. And over two days, I engaged in a flame war with the transport blog lobby. Um, who, are far more, who are far more informed on everything to do with transport than I am. Um, and I wouldn't have done it if I wasn't sick, but I had time. And, uh, and I shouldn't have. And never mix politics, religion, sex or transport um, in any public discussion. So look, but, you know, these are people, the, the, the people who do it are informed and are really working hard to put information out there. I, I applaud it. The, the value facts. And, and actually that takes me something to Mark that, that I gather you said in Wellington today that, that views are replacing news. Can you expand on that? Yes. Um, and, and it's interesting because I see that spin-off is mainly a views and commentary site and it's successful so I'm not 
um, negative on it. But I think it has to sit alongside uh, strong, real reporting. And I think it also has to sit alongside investigative reporting. And it's part of the mix. I, I think it's getting too much of the mix, personally. And I think it's cheap. Uh, it's easy to do. You don't have to go anywhere. You just sit down, uh, read something, write about it, sit down, watch something, write about it. It doesn't require real reporting. It doesn't require going out and actually collecting the facts. So that's, that was my point at the conference today. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> One clap. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, Wellington gave me more claps, actually, and I like Wellington uh, because um, the people down there are more engaged in politics and they're more engaged in local body politics as well. And I think Auckland is a wee bit apathetic about this at times. Um, don't think we get out enough and vote. You know, only 10% of people that rented houses in Auckland that were under 30 voted at the last local body elections. That is uh, courtesy of Bernard Hickey. He told me that today. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a wee bit down on views. Um, I think it's fine as long as it's balanced with uh, real journalism. I would point out that you managed Patrick Gower, who I think has <laughs> editorialised more than any other political editor in history. Well, no one manages Patrick. So <laughs> you, you, you don't manage him, you just, you know... You point to... him at things. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Mm. But, Pat, but, but Paddy, Paddy breaks stories too, and he, he, he does plenty of real journalism in my view, and a very good journalist in my view. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, um, Tim, I first came across you as um, a, an editor who would never be interviewed, who never said anything, would never come on my TV show, and all of a sudden you became quite voluble and you're everywhere. expansive on Twitter, and you're, and you're everywhere, um, particularly since you've, you've left the corporate media. What, what happened? <laughs> Two things. When I took over as editor of the paper, we'd had an editor who had been extremely high profile, extremely controversial, and left the paper in dire circumstances. I made a pledge to myself, I keep my head down, just keep doing what the paper's team needed doing and not engage. And so that was probably small-minded, now I think about it, but it was a sort of a defensive thing just to, just to approach as it was. Um, since I've left the paper, I also realised I've been way too tribal. I was way too tribal. And because I didn't need to engage that much with other competitors and others um, in the media, I didn't. And ever since, and all the people we've encountered since, I realised how that wasn't the right approach. And so now I'm trying. Uh, to do that and to well, I think engage. you're enjoying it. Yeah. Well, there's <laughs> another um, reason here, Russell, that no one's touched on. He's a shit stirrer. <laughs> and he enjoys it. And um, I'm trying to pull him back all the time, which is unusual for me. Anyway. Whereas you, mm. you, Mark, on the other hand, have a Twitter account that has never posted a tweet. No, <laughs> no um, because... You're, you are lurking. <laughs> because I'm scared of Twitter, frankly. Um, I'm not a, I don't really like Twitter and I don't know about it. Um, I've become a Facebook fan um, and I think you know Facebook is a, a great platform sort of in many ways for pseudo reporting. Um, I, li I like it but I, I just don't like Twitter. Um, actually I mean the, the interesting thing is there's a lot more people, we, we only confirmed it today that we have a Facebook live stream and a lot more people have watched the Facebook live stream than the YouTube stream that we've been pimping for two weeks <laughs> which suggests that um, media have to make their peace with these big organisations and particularly Facebook. How do we do it? Yeah, yeah well I think you know I was looking there's, there's a thing Google are doing now where if you are doing investigations I think they call it living stories um, and you can get yourself up the rankings um, by doing this and I think something like that is a positive from Google um, but again I just go back to this thing I, I, I think they are really dodging their responsibility and somehow they're going to have to be shamed into, into this and I don't know how to do that but um, it's got to happen. Hmm. Um, yeah, a, a, a levy on them is, yeah. is a, a really nice suggestion. Maybe a levy on Sky TV as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think we've come to the point now of expanding the discussion and taking it to um, our concluding panel, and we'll probably talk for 20 minutes to half an hour. Um, so I'm basically now filling time while someone grabs the box from over there. Excellent. Mm. 
Oh, no, he's got it. Trust the marketing guy to be on it. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Oh, we do have some in there. All right. Um, we actually do have another. Hello, Hugh. Yeah, I think so. Um, we do actually have some other microphones. Yeah, yeah. There we go. You hold those for a moment. <laughs> right. Okay. is not with us because she's had to rush away and uh, write a, her power rankings for mm. tonight's episode of um, Real Housewives of Auckland. That's not a real job. <laughs> They're not real people. <laughs> um, I've kind of saved, sort of deliberately saved uh, some of the big what is the future of journalism um, questions that I was going to ask you two for, for the whole panel because um, I think everyone's going to have an input. Um, and we do also have um, some questions from you. But um, I was actually interested in another thing, Mark, I saw you reported as saying um, about the biggest challenge for journalists at the moment, and you said it was time. Can you expand on that? Yes. Um, I think we're in the era of journalism, and, uh, you know, reporters doing seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven stories a day. Um, that. You, you can't be a proper journalist doing that. And I think you need time to go out, gather the information, talk to people, think about what you're doing, and then write it. And I think this whole speed issue, you know, um, the warp speed of getting information out now is, is a real problem. And uh, I was talking about that today. I think it's a a major impediment to quality journalism, the speed at which journalists have to work and the amount of stories that they have to do. Uh, I know that it's an economic reality, but, you know, it's it's a problem. I, I heard Paula Penfold speak about the, about the Tainapura yes. story um, last year, and I said, how did you, I actually asked her that question, how did you find the time to do this on top of all the other stuff you're expected to do? And she said, we did it after hours. Which is kind of is kind of amazing that that it comes to that. I mean, that's yeah, remarkable. Yeah, I think it does come to that, and I think that's um, n no journalist regards it as a job anymore. If you're in it for a job, you, you won't be in it for long. It, it is a vocation. It is something you do uh, because you really love doing it. And yeah, all the good journalists I know work after hours, work really long hours, and. The worst thing is they don't really they don't get paid for it either now. Experience isn't valued uh, in the same way as it was, and that's 
you know, a, another big problem. All these senior journalists are exiting the media, or have exited, or been exited uh, as well. So, yeah. Um, do you guys find that as well? I mean, I, I'm suspecting it's an issue with you, because <laughs> you get into stories, don't you, Kirsty? Yeah, but I'm what uh, Nikki Hager called me a kakapo means I'm rare and endangered um, <laughs> because I have a full-time investigative job and there's only a few of us and we know that we're really lucky. And so we really strive on our team at The Hero to try and kind of do as much as we can to alleviate the pressure on everybody else. Um, so we will step in and just do a feature that week because it's an issue that needs to be done or, you know, somebody needs to go away. So we will step in. Like, none of us... Like, we're all so aware that we are so privileged that we try and do that, but equally, I don't know how long it can go on. Like, we are lucky. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my thoughts are that the best thing that could happen would be if people started to pay for journalism, <laughs> and then we would actually get paid. That's How many of you are there? Set of interest? Um, so there's myself, Olivia, who's here tonight, um, Matt Nippert, David Fisher, Phil Taylor... There's actually quite a lot of us. There's probably seven of us. We have kind of differing roles, but yeah, we are really, really privileged and grateful to the Herald for for doing that. And I think that's actually something that needs acknowledging because usually we're saying Herald website clickbait, but it's also the Herald that maintains an investigative team and a data journalism team, mm. and no one else is doing that to that extent. Um, do you? I mean, guy. On, do you worry about, you know, do you ever think you made a poor career choice? Because I do sometimes. <laughs> Some of my listeners probably do. Um, but no, I mean, I've had a fantastic time in journalism and done an incredible amount of fun stuff. But it's just uh, changing so quickly. I mean, it's not long ago I was working um, with Mark and with Paula Penfold on Third Degree and before that 60 Minutes. We would have a month to do a story a month to do a television story and what you could do with good cameramen, good producers, good journalists was phenomenal and the and the power of, of television when you've actually spent that long bringing something. I mean Paula Penfold and Eugene Bingham got someone out of jail. I mean it's a phenomenal thing to do and the power of television when it's actually done well like that is an immense and really strong public good. And what Mark's been talking about tonight is absolutely true. The business model which backs that up is completely broken. And we're really going to have to look for new sources of doing that. And it has to be valued as a public good. People have to realise what are the consequences of not having that, of not being able to hold politicians to account, of not being able to dig into things like tax evasion or whatever it is. And the impact of that is a massive democratic deficit, and we're seeing that in, in parts of the world. And people need to realise it's not a, just about, oh, some journalists are going to lose their jobs. I mean, who cares about journalists? They don't care, and they shouldn't care about you know, whether someone has a job or not. That's not their problem. The problem is a deeper, bigger one than that, which is you can't function as a proper civic society and as a strong democracy if you don't have those platforms. You simply can't do it. People talk about post-truth, whatever the, the catchphrase is. You're basically in a world where you can get away with anything. I mean, I want these guys to be sitting around a cabinet table saying, shit, we're not going to get away with this on, on Morning Report or 60 Minutes or someone's going to dig in or the Herald's going to find out because that's what they do. They think, shit, am I going to be able to get away with this? And if they think they can get away with it and I'm only going to be asked who my favourite Olympian is on my Monday morning interview, and this happens, or what I thought of the rugby mate on the weekend then they are going to... You see a society slip. You don't have to look far around the world, and it will, and it'll slip. And that's why I think that's the case we need to make, not us poor journalists. It's what we will lose if you lose that sort of stuff. Yeah, well said. <laughs> and Mark sounded a note of hope that he, he thinks people are, are, are getting to grips with that. Do you, do you agree? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure about that, actually. Um, why are you hopeful? Because <laughs> he went to a conference in Wellington. <laughs> <laughs> and they clashed. <laughs> uh, oh, I just think um, that the more... Like, Tim's right. Since we've been out of our respective organisations, we've become a lot less tribal and we've talked to a lot of people. And the one thing that gives us a bit of confidence and hope is the amount of people that say to us, 
We need quality journalism. We need it. And, it, that, and they're from all walks of life. And Tim, that's right, isn't it? We've run into Yeah, it's life, unsolicited, but. and it's, it's from your own personal networks and their networks that people just run into. They're saying, why can't we have what they felt was the journalist at role before? So I think there's a, 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 it's not just people telling us what we want to hear. We're not talking about just people across meeting rooms. We're talking about the general view that something's not right in what journalism can do for the country or the place uh, and people are feeling that they need to make it right um, one way or the other. They, they don't know what quite to do but yeah. The, the question, the, the thing is though, we have to get them to pay for it and that is such a hard thing um, particularly when like I look at my own daughter, she's um, grown up uh, with free access to everything. Um, you know she breaks the law and, and not in a not in a bad way, but um, <laughs> she does, and she doesn't think she is. And uh, so I think getting people to pay is our challenge, and uh, it's a big challenge, Russell, and you've experienced it, and I don't know really the answer to that. My own view is I think that people need to, to call on, on government to actually fund it publicly rather than asking people to pay. Um, and, and, and look, I'm, I'm appreciative to everyone who actually pays for Radio New Zealand. It's, it's amazing. I mean, that's, it, it, it's, it's yours. You know, I hope you get some value out of it. But, you know, if, you, if we're going to start levying people small amounts on here and there, as Mark says, culturally, you can't, you can't get the toothpaste back into the tube in that respect. If, you, if, if people have watched the Herald and read the Herald and watched this and that for free, it's pretty hard to get them to pay for it. My own view is that you're going to need to... Uh, convince the public it's worth shouting loud enough, and the government can afford this. I mean, this is a $250 billion economy. I mean, you know, what does it put into, into public broadcasting every year? Jane Wrightson can tell us. <laughs> How much? 80 million into public broadcasting. You know, well, so, you know... But most of that's not for journalism. No, so. that's not for print journalism in any way, shape or form. And I think, I think we need to look at that. You know, I think we need to look at not only broadcast, but, but, but print as well, and ha yeah, have a pot of money. And we need to think about, do we want decisions made on funding by partisan political interests? And, and they will be partisan at certain times. Maybe that's not, why maybe... you need a better structure around it. Like sure. in, the, in the BBC, you, do, you don't just have one, you have a, you have a, a better, a, a more of an arm's length approach. Yeah. You know, you don't just have, in New Zealand you have the minister appoints a board, you know, and, and it's a bit too close. I think we need to think about those structures too. But equally, I mean, I think that the Herald does campaigns all the time in which we raise money for things. So does Stuff, so does TV. Campbell used to do it all the time. If we drew a line in the sand and said, look, humans, this is what it's come to. We can't afford to fly a person to Wellington to investigate this thing that is central to not only human rights but democracy. You know, if we said you need to start paying, then, you know, what's... I mean, you sponsor a child for a dollar a day. You can sponsor your local newspaper. It's the cost of a coffee. But, but you kind of do because you, you know? pay $2.60 a day to your That's local true. newspaper. This is true. It's if true. It's true. So, you know, but I just think it's that... It's the digital part of it. But, equally, yeah. like, if we put as much effort into trying to promote ourselves and trying to draw public attention, it's what we're good at. It's what we do for jobs. We draw public attention to other issues. If we could somehow draw it to ourselves, I think yeah. it's just as important as getting the government to fund it. And maybe it's all part of the same parcel. But I don't think we should give up on people actually paying for things altogether yeah. just yet. Yeah. It's Google and Facebook, and they're parasites all right. They are sucking money out of the media industry that pays for good journalism. Mark identified it before. Mm. Um, so, Mark, Mark, Gra Mark Graham, magazine publisher, has, has put it to us that, that Google and Facebook are um, parasites that yeah. are sucking money. 85% 80, of all digital revenues in the US go to Facebook and Google. Um, and increasingly here, yeah. and they pay no tax here. Yeah. No, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. um, Bernard Hickey made the point today that he and his wife paid more tax yes. than Google yes. in New Zealand last year. Mm -hmm. So how do we address that? It's government action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where's the government? Well, that's you. Are, you tell me. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds like this. This needs some organisation, and um, it, it's interesting the idea of, of public-funded media. Um, and, and Duncan Grieve 
wrote a column that I, I thought had some merit, but I think we can't put all this on NZ on air, um, and I'm sure Jane Wrightson, who's in the audience, will be relieved to hear that. This needs something new, doesn't it? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm not suggesting you know that that's the only stream of funding at all. You know, obviously, you know, commercial and private media has, has got a big, big uh, role to play. I, I just think that if people value it and think it's important enough that their taxes should go to it, then you know, let's have let's have that debate. Should we go rattle through a few questions from the audience? Should we choose one at random? Yeah. <coughs> okay. Let us go with. Uh, what are your thoughts on the underrepresentation of people of colour in journalism and media? Oh, I think we've got it. Hold on. Well, Tim is part Tongan, so I think he should answer this. <laughs> um, this is actually a subject, obviously, quite close to my heart, um, and one that I did a talk down in um, at Wintech last week about um, about Māori representation, Pacific representation in New Zealand. Um, and I sort of talked about the fact that um, it has to start at journalism schools, schools and then journalism schools, and there are no longer, um, for instance, the bicultural journalism degree no longer exists. Um, there's a Pacific journalism degree at AUT, and I think that's about the extent of it. Um, anecdotally, I get told all the time about how newsrooms are becoming more diverse. Um, but when it comes to print journalism, I, as a Māori editor, really struggle to find um, new writing talent. A lot of Māori get um, ushered into broadcasting, t into television, into radio, but um, I feel like very few have been encouraged to write. Um, is this, I mean, how important is it to, say, the head of a, a, a newsroom to um, ensure that you get that uh, balance of perspectives as far as sort of taking from Māori Pacific, Asian cultural perspectives? Oh, look, it's vital and it's been a failure, um, sustained failure for so long, uh, not just by newsroom bosses and people who have made their calls or by in terms of employment, but by the the flow of and the stimulation and the kind of encouragement to people to take up this cause and journalism and reporting uh, and and stay with it uh, and stay with it in text and digital, not just be attracted perhaps to the funded uh, Maori TV or wherever. Um, but you know, over all the years, uh, the, the, the discussion is constant, and that I was there in the Herald and the uh, attempts to not just be satisfied with representation, but to, to expand beyond that, we're, we're constant as well. Mm. Uh, but we failed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it strikes me also that when you get that right, you also get new and different kinds of stories. I mean, just the simple thing of having a reporter who can read Chinese text yep. will get you a whole lot of stories. Um, yeah, so there are benefits to it as well. I don't just think it's a failure of the industry, like I've been into a few journalism schools lately and they are predominantly Pākehā, but you have to look as well, like I was the education reporter last year and you look at the statistics of our young Māori and Pacifica kids coming through to university, they are so well below Pākehā and Asian kids that it's like you're on the back foot from the start and then the degrees that they are going into aren't journalism, so it's not just us, it's everyone, but we we should be responsible for putting it out there earlier, like you said, Leonie. And before journalism school, high school, mm. earlier. And I wonder whether um, the way the media covers some of these issues and the focus that, that it places on some of these issues is a turn off too. Yeah. You know, whether if your culture is represented more in, you know, in the crime stories and the sports stories and other stories, yeah then maybe that's a factor as well. So I think we have to look to ourselves. I think, um, I agree with Tim, I think the media's failed pretty pretty badly uh, on this stuff. And yeah, Māori and Pacific, yeah, there's, there's, there's good stuff happening and you've got Māori TV and stuff and you know, there's a lot of Pacifica pro uh, programmes as well. I think the, the massive Asian voice in New Zealand, I mean, I'm fascinated to, to find out what these stories are, and I just don't think we're doing a very good job at all of, of actually <laughs> covering these stories for, for New Zealand because we haven't got the expertise in, in doing it, and um, it's just it's, that, that presence just isn't there. Yeah, I think there's another problem with this, um, and I had a long discussion with Mickey Forbes about it, 
is that we often in newsrooms hire one or at best two. And those journalists, um, Māori journalists or Pacific journalists, they can't survive in a newsroom mm. with that number. Mm -hmm. So you need to hire four or five mm -hmm. and, and, and have enough uh, collegiality mm -hmm. for them to, to flourish. Yeah. And that's something I only woke up to very late in the piece. Yeah, um, And I think you need to not dictate to them. Like, if they are going to be in your newsroom, you need to give them a voice and you need to listen when they talk. So if a Pacifica or an um, Asian journalist says, this is wrong, this is how we should be covering the story, this is what the community thinks, then you should listen to it. And I don't think that's always what happens in a Pakia-centric newsroom. Those were really interesting answers, yeah. actually. Yeah. Should we go for another one? Should we go for another one? Um, the spin-off have been discussing sponsored investigative journalism. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when this book we're discussing this. Well, just as a general principle, so right. this um, extremely important investigation brought to you by ASB Bank. <laughs> Does it happen? I don't know that it happens really. Um, Should it happen? Is it okay? No, because you can't really in terms of invest. If you're talking about an investigation, well, did I Campbell do investigative journalism? On John, Campbell Live? John Campbell. Yeah, and yep. that was sponsored by Mazda? Yeah, I think, sorry, uh, the story brought to you by Mazda is different to this program's kind of general ad at the start. I think there's a distinction between sponsored sort of segments or shows and when you say we've investigated, you know, um, uh, special needs education with the help of whomever. I, I don't think you can, and I, I would, I'd be old fashioned on that. I think there is, though, a way of perhaps crowdfunding investigations by saying, all right, we're going to investigate, perhaps as a spin off has, mm -hmm. the Auckland housing crisis. Who, who wants to contribute to this? And, yep. uh, and you know, people will put money into that. Um, I don't particularly like the model because I think some stories go nowhere. Um, as you know, Guy, on having worked on investigations, several of mine went nowhere. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, um, some unexpected things go somewhere. So, um, yeah, I don't like the model particularly, but I can see that it maybe has some place. Right, we're going to another question now. Um, is there a degree of laziness amongst some journalists regarding who they seek comment from, e.g. asking the Real Estate Institute about house prices, or Garth McVicker about domestic abuse, or Bob McCoskery about <laughs> fucking anything? <laughs> I mean, that there is a temptation when you're time-pressed, you know that Bob McCoskery will pick up the phone. Um, can we get away from... Yeah, there are, there are talking heads who will give good quotes whether they know anything or not. Do we do too much of that? Oh, definitely. I think I think um, the questioner is, is right. We are too lazy. Some of it comes back to the time pressures that um, Mark talks about, but you've always, you've always got time to be a little bit creative, and I think we do far too much of that. You know, we um, there's a great wealth of, of talent and voices and opinions in New Zealand, and I think we do a listeners and readers and viewers a disservice when we keep going back to the same sources and it's boring yeah. you know I mean Gareth Morgan's view on everything or um, whatever I mean you know and we once people sort of do quite well and get a bit of a profile it's very tempting for a, a time poor producer just to go back to them every time but I think I personally think we need to do better and I used to um, when I was editor of the paper used to stage interventions and ban people from being people we'd go to and people would say, well, you can't ban someone, you can't have that restricting free speech. And well, actually, because it's just been incessant and clichéd with who we're going to, and we need to broaden. Um, so, yeah, I think you can actually take a view that we will not uh, talk to this person for this reason, for the length of time, you know. Um, I have to say, my, my big bugbear this year was treating people who have um, meth contamination testing companies as experts. Um, <laughs> yes. Rather than deeply conflicted parties, and I think too much of that went on. Um, I, I think we're, we're near winding up, but I, I, one thing that, and, and I've actually mentioned it in the chapter of the book that's coming out this weekend, is that if there's an upside to the, the existential crisis in journalism, it's that it's made us all think about what we're here for. And, and um, Leonie, I think I've seen you know, that in what you've done with Mana. You've had to think about what it's there for. 
you know, it, it could have gone away, but you, you know, it hasn't. Yeah. Do you agree? Uh, I do actually. I mean, I I feel like in uh, any media path, you sort of have to pick a goal and work towards it. Um, otherwise, like you say, what are we here for? Um, and that's certainly what we have uh, done at Mana. We have goals for Māori media and Māori journalism um, that don't involve just sort of keeping up with news, that actually involve developing talent and uh, investing in investigative journalism specifically to do with Māori and Māori issues. Um, but, you know, I, I see examples of that in all of the um, the great media, media practitioners that we have um, talked to tonight. I mean, it's all about finding your purpose and finding your goal and working towards that for the betterment of New Zealand media. So has it focused your mind, Tim? I'm going to go around to all of you. Yeah, so uh, look, I'm, to be cliched in a way, uh, I think that old saying of never waste a good crisis, uh, really, <laughs> that this is a crisis and good things will come out of it once the rubbing up and the sanding down occur, you know. Mike? Yeah, I'm a little bit more pessimistic. I, I think we're going to go through um, a, a fair bit more pain yet. And um, I was talking, I think, to Alan uh, Perrault tonight, um, where he's saying that we probably have to hit rock bottom before it gets better. And I'm, I'm hoping he's not true, but I have a little suspicion that he might be. Um, yeah, I think we're... And I'm thinking going back to the merger here, Fairfax and um, Herald, if that happens, I think there will be players, and Tim and I are hoping that we'll be one of them, um, that will float up uh, in this. Uh, there's, where there's um, rationalisation, there's always opportunity, uh, and new players will emerge. And we think there's a lot of good journalists out there. And, and if you look at the spin-off too, um, the quality of people they can get to write articles for them um, staggers me. You yes. see Geoffrey Palmer and all these people writing articles, and I think, gee, that's something to tap into, and that gives me uh, hope too, Russell. Kirsty? What was the question? <laughs> question was, if there's an upside to the current existential crisis in journalism, uh, it's that we all have to now think what the fuck we're here for, whereas it used to be a low-threat environment, and maybe we just turned up at work. Yeah, I mean, every day I think, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this story? What purpose does it have? And whenever I go to do a story now, I write on the top, I'm like, I ask myself, what am I going to achieve? Like, what is it for? What does it mean? What is it going to gain? And I will pick some themes and I will write across the top in big freaking red letters. Because otherwise you forget, you're like, why am I doing this? Am I just being self-interested? What is the point? And I think that might be either personal, like me evolving, or because it is a sharp thing and I realise I'm in a privileged position and every single story that I do needs to matter so that, you know, places like the Herald continue to pay people like me to do my job. Go on. Yeah, I kind of uh, want to agree with Mark and largely do. I um, interviewed Julia Gillard last year who said, and it's a strange analogy, but I think it works, she said that when the tariffs came off uh, the clothing industry in Australia, everyone ran around trying to cut costs and produce mass-produce crap, and it was a race to the bottom because they were trying to get the lowest cost for, for the production. Then after a while, which I think has probably happened in New Zealand, the clothing industry a little bit too, is it became bespoke and tailored and, and high-end because uh, there were fewer players and that's what they're doing. And I in my more optimistic um, moments, um, hope that that's what might, might happen in New Zealand. We all need to be Karen Walker. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's us for tonight. It's actually, it's been magnificent. This is the best one of these we've done so far. Thanks so much to Golden Dawn, to 95BFM, and especially to Orcon. Um, yeah, we have two more of these scheduled for the year. Uh, one is around the local body elections, and then we've got a party one in December where we'll have tigers on a gold leash. Um, <laughs> Um, thank you for turning up. Thank you to everyone who's watched online. Thanks to Leonie. I think you've been an awesome debutante. Thank you. Will you come back? I don't know anything about local elections. Oh, <laughs> just vote. <laughs> yeah, I know how to do that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Please give our panellists a big thank you.